Hi, Simon Smart here. There are some things we don't typically like to talk about, and death is probably high on that list. But it's something that's all around us. It's part of life. Something I've often wondered is whether there's actually a way to do grief well. So in this episode from last year, we spoke with a musician and a philosopher about their experience of losing a loved one. Here's the story. Welcome to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. I'm Natasha Moore. And I'm Simon Smart. It's been said that nothing in life is certain but death and taxes. But even though death and grief come to everyone at some point, this is something that we talk about surprisingly little. And it's something that we don't necessarily do all that well as a culture. The poet Octavio Paz, back in 1961, wrote that the word death is not pronounced in New York, in Paris, in London, because it burns the lips. How a culture deals with death, the resources that it has to offer as we try to cope with bereavement, those things say a lot about us. And traditionally, and in many places around the world still today, this has been a religious thing. Uh, there have been certain rituals and beliefs that have guided people through this experience. There's sort of well-worn grooves that give space for people to grieve and a framework for understanding what's happened. Certainly in Australia, death and grief have become far more secular. So a 2014 survey showed that a civil celebrant now performs six out of ten funerals. Of course, everybody processes loss in their own way, sometimes in very creative, personal ways. Well, I was born in Northern Ireland and I lived there till I was about 10. We were kind of a a fairly close family. We lived um, down near the shipyards in Belfast and my grandmother um, lived near my school so it was often um, a case where I'd go home after school and stay with my grandmother and stuff. This is Phil Davidson. He's a songwriter from the Blue Mountains just outside of Sydney. For him, it was at this young age that he was already starting to say goodbye to his grandmother. And in those days, when you left Ireland, that was pretty much it. You never returned because it was just such a, a long journey. You know, you did it by boat. As it turned out, um, Phil was able to see his grandmother a few more times while she was still alive. Every time I saw her, I got to kind of put together a few of the pieces of the puzzle that made up me. She would share her memories about his childhood that he had long forgotten and tell him things about his family that he'd never heard before. You know, stories about my parents as well, you know, their dating and, you know, their life as, as children and even her life as a child, you know, all those kind of things. And it was all that really rich stuff that grandparents bring to, to families, you know. In 2010, Phil would see his grandmother for the last time. It had been 10 years since they'd last met. Her health had declined and she was living with dementia. I had this hope inside that maybe when I, when I saw her that it would spark something in her and she'd go, oh, you know, Philip's back, you know. Maybe this was going to trigger something in her that was some memory that was just going to give us a final moment together. And it just didn't happen. And that night, after seeing his grandmother for what he knew would be the last time, he couldn't sleep. And I could hear the foghorns of the ships that were leaving um, Belfast Harbour and going out to sea. As, as I was lying there just thinking about my grandmother, I could hear these foghorns and I'm thinking, these are kind of all lost at sea, you know. It's almost like they're out there not knowing how to get in or waiting, you know, just drifting around. And I thought that's a great kind of analogy of how I was feeling. I felt really lost at sea at that point. Um, but she was also lost at sea as well. And I thought, I've got to do something about that. I've got to write something that kind of connects all that together and, and helps me to work through my grief. This is some of what Phil wrote that night. Well, my plane touched down in Belfast in the coldest day of the year. Storms out of the Arctic Nearly blew us out of here Smoke upon the skyline From a thousand coal fires Calling back the memories When I was just a child Oh, Bellamina Agnes She's all adrift at sea She can't remember She loved me. Just a few months later, when Phil was back in Australia, Agnes passed away. She was a Christian woman and I knew that she was longing to go home and I knew that that was where her heart was and that her journey was finally over. You know, like that boat 
you know, that was lost at sea, it's finally arrived, it's home. Simon, you were telling me that actually you've been to quite a few funerals lately. Um, it's always pretty confronting, isn't it? You know, it's not really something that you get used to. No, it isn't. And I have been going to quite a few and it's mostly because I've reached an age where especially the people from my parents' generation, you know, people who are big kind of figures in my childhood and they're either getting very old and declining or dying. And I have been going to a few of those funerals. It is a bit confronting to be sort of confronted with that point in your life where you think, gosh, these people are going and um, they're, they're gone. I won't see them again. I suppose it really brings home to you that this is a universal experience, which we know, but it's quite invisible to us a lot of the time. Um, so what's your impression of how we deal with death today? Do you think we manage this well? I don't think we do. I mean, our culture seems to be big on denying death. We have this sense that it's almost an aberration that health and well-being and success are the norm and this sort of loss is a kind of terrible mistake and we're surprised when it happens even though it happens all the time. Grief and loss are common but they do feel at a fundamental level just something profoundly wrong about it. The world isn't quite as it's supposed to be. And I suppose we could say where there's smoke there's fire. Yeah, I think so. It feels like we have this deep sense that something isn't meant to be like this, that it, it actually is a terrible thing. And I'm reminded that in the, the Bible really paints that picture of death as being the last enemy. It's a defeated enemy. The whole sort of Jesus rising from the dead is about this power of death being broken. Yeah, I remember um, reading something that C.S. Lewis, who you know, is the writer of Narnia, among other things, when a friend of his died, it was this poet called Charles Williams. Um, and Lewis wrote that when the idea of death and the idea of Charles Williams met in his mind, for him it was the idea of death that changed, that he just couldn't believe that this friend of his had ceased to exist. Um, And that really struck me. But, you know, lots of people would call that wish fulfilment, you know, wanting to believe in an afterlife, a reunion after death. Hardly anyone in those situations uh, faced with this terrible loss is really truly comfortable saying, oh, well, you know, that's it, they're gone. We have this sense of somehow or other, this can't be all that uh, this life meant. I felt this very thing recently at a a very large funeral of a kind of amazingly loved uh, former headmaster of a big school in Sydney. And uh, you just got this great sense, not that, um, well, this is just part of life and it's the end. There was a really, there's a real sadness and a real loss. Also, though, it was very uplifting. It was kind of lots of laughs. There was lots of uh, celebration of this life. And there were some great talks given. But there was this very strong sense that this is not the end of the story. It was full of Christian hope. This is a Christian man who was very, very trusting in the story of Jesus as the resurrection and the life. Some people say that's a false hope. But, you know, I felt it powerfully. You're listening to Life and Faith. If you've just joined us, we're talking about grief. I suppose in one sense, the Christian faith says that death is much worse than we think, that our instincts in the face of death are right. It's really not okay. But it also says that there's far more hope and comfort to be found in the face of death, whether that's our own impending death or the death of people we love, than we might imagine. I have experienced painful loss. Our eldest son, Eric, was killed in a mountain climbing accident in 1983. He was doing what he loved, and that seems to me makes his death different from, for example, a suicide, which which I think is much more difficult for a parent to cope with. But the death of a child is painful to cope with in any case. This is Nicholas Walterstorff, the American philosopher and theologian. He wrote about the loss of his son Eric in his book Lament for a Son. And Simon asked him recently about what it's meant for him to cope with that grief. You'll hear in this interview, there's really nothing glib or kind of chin up about his struggle with loss and faith. He insists that even for a Christian person, there are no easy answers. So it naturally, for a religious person like myself, Christian raises questions about where God is in this. I am a philosopher and I've read the philosophical attempts to explain. I don't find any of them compelling. 
So I live with unanswered questions. I continue to have faith in that there is a creator of this universe, uh, and that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. But how I fit that all together with the early death of a beloved son, I live with an unanswered question. How do you kind of reconcile this sort of promise within Christianity of a full life with the painful reality that's present even in blessed lives that all experience? So the reason it's difficult, it seems to me, is that there is in Christianity in each and every strain. God desires that each and every human being flourish until full of years. Not, not just the species, but each and every human being to flourish until full of years. And so when we see somebody full of years who hasn't flourished, or somebody who's flourishing like my son, but not until he's full of years, we, we have to ask, how does this compute? How does this fit? And um, one of the philosophical answers is that it makes the rest of us better. Uh, I don't know if I'm better because of Eric's death, but even if I am, I would give, trade that betterness for his life any, any time. When we talk about Christian hope within that sort of sadness, yes. is that something that you would attest to? So my grief is not without hope. It's, I suppose it's, you might even say it's contained within hope or intertwined with hope. I hope for a new day, the day of the resurrection. But it's not, it's not a despairing kind of grief. It's got a different quality from somebody who says we're nothing but molecules. I wonder about the practice of lament which you've written about. It seems very foreign today, this idea of lament. Uh, in the, and in this sort of world of kind of positive thinking and personal development, lament seems a very, very foreign idea. But what can lament offer people today? We talk about uh, getting over it, putting it behind you, getting on with things, language like that. Most people try to disown grief or encourage the other person to disown this, their grief. So that it's not really part of them anymore. They don't think about it, don't remember it, don't mention it, and so forth. I think, for me anyway, my challenge was to own my grief, not to disown it, but to own it in such a way that some sort of good would come out of it, if, if at all possible. Uh, and lament is a natural part of that. If you disown it, get on with things, that sort of thing. You're, you're not going, to, lament is the last thing you're going to do because, because that brings it, <laughs> because that inherently brings it back, right, when, when, when you want to put it behind you. To lament requires a different attitude towards grief, death, loss, from that which is common in our culture, which is the getting over it, putting it behind you um, attitude. And it offers you a possibility of processing things, but also protesting, does it not? So lament then is the recognition, is, is, is the explicit recognition that this is something to grieve over and to continue grieving over. If My view is that if Eric was worth loving when alive, then he's worth grieving over when, when dead. Um, but the lament also is a, at the same time as a protest. It, the lament brings the memory back to life in the context of saying, this should not be. This is, this is not something to celebrate. This, this should not be. So it's got a quality of, of protest to it. It blends honoring with protest. There's somewhere along there in your scheme of thinking the concept of the suffering God have, have any resonance for you? So at the heart of Christianity then is the recognition, is the worship of a suffering Savior, suffering Jesus Christ. And I think that for me anyway, but I think that for lots of other people. That, as opposed to an, a totally impassive, transcendent God, represents in a deep sort of way a consolation. God and I are in this together, as it were, co-sufferers, mysterious as that is. That interview is with the philosopher Nicholas Walterstorff about his son's death and his experience of grief. And the song is by Phil Davidson about the decline and death of his grandmother, Agnes. She can't remember And she loved me You can find Ballymena Agnes and more of Phil's music on his Facebook page.
You've been listening to Life and Faith in the Centre for Public Christianity. I'm Simon Smart, and Natasha and I have been talking about grief and loss and what hope can be found in the face of death. This story is available on our website, publicchristianity.org, and on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Just type Life and Faith in the search box to find us. Next week, how a freak accident turned a man's life upside down. 